This is a crash course in the basics of infrared light. It used to be the case a long time ago that professional astronomers, if they were trained in one wavelength, they just spent their whole career stuck with just that one wavelength. If they did their work initially in optical wavelengths, then the rest of their career was spent in optical wavelengths. If they were trained in radio wavelengths, they spent the rest of their career working in radio wavelengths. That was just the way of the world. But that is not the case anymore. You really have to take advantage of all the light that you get because we're studying things that we can never ever visit. We are studying things that we can't even turn around and see from another angle. So you really have to take advantage of all of the information that we're getting from these objects, all of the kinds of light and really at this point we're also getting multi-messenger astrophysics we're getting things like gravitational waves and neutrinos but in this context of this talk i'm just going to be talking about electromagnetic radiation all the different kinds of light that we get from um, astronomical objects so this is the same little galaxy seen at many different wavelengths all the way on the left there's an x-ray image from a telescope called chandra which observes in the x-rays the next image is in the ultraviolet from a telescope called Galax. The middle one is an optical image from the Hubble Space Telescope. The next image is a near-infrared image. It could be uh, that you use, for near-infrared data, you could use a ground-based survey called 2MASS, but this particular image is from Spitzer. Then the last one is a far-infrared image, which could include Spitzer data, but in this particular image it's using Herschel data. So the wavelengths that we're considering here. So in x-rays, it's a two nanometers. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. The temperatures of things that emit in x-rays are like a, a million Kelvin. And for those kinds of temperatures, you're looking at things like black hole accretion disks. In the ultraviolet, you're looking at wavelengths of like 200 nanometers. You're looking at things that are like 15,000 Kelvin. Those are the hot stars, which are also the young stars. In the optical, the wavelengths of light are like 500 nanometers or half a micron. A micron is a millionth of a meter. Those kinds of things are about 6,000 Kelvin, and those are the run-of-the-mill stars, like our sun, sort of all ages. In the near-infrared, you're looking at things that are about 1,600 nanometers or about 2 microns. You're looking at things that are about 2,000 Kelvin. Those are generally the very, very cool stars, which are usually the old stars. Um, in the far infrared, you're looking at wavelengths that are like 100,000 nanometers or 100 microns, um, about 30 Kelvin. Those tend to be the, the stuff that's emitting at those wavelengths tends to be the cool dust, which is heated by the hot stars. This is how we at IPAC view the electromagnetic spectrum. We are very, very biased towards the infrared because that's what we do. We do a lot of infrared at IPAC. So here's a little dog seen on the left in visible light and on the right in infrared light. So there's two really important things to note about this image. The first thing is that this is a false color or remapped color image. That's because I've taken the wavelengths of infrared light and translated them into wavelengths of light that we can see. That's because our eyes don't see infrared light. So a quote unquote true color infrared image would be really, really, really boring. So I have to remap those infrared photons into light that we can see. So sometimes you've heard the term false color, but I really don't like that because as I said, you know, true color infrared light is really boring. So remapped color makes more sense. It's a truer representation of what's going on. I'm remapping the infrared photons into light that we can see. And the other really important thing is that the way that I'm doing it in this particular context is mapped by the temperature of the stuff that's emitting. So the coolest things in this image are black or blue, and the warmest things are yellow or white. So you can see that his water dish is cool, but you can also see that he's a fluffy little dog. So his ears are warm, his face is warm, his eyes are very warm, his mouth is warm. The fluffy halo of fur around his head though is cool. And because he's a healthy little dog, his nose is also cold. So now you know that hot things glow in the infrared. So which one of these is the hot water? Is it the top or the bottom? 
of course it's the bottom you can see the base of the faucet heating up there you can see the base of the faucet heating up you can see the basin heating up even though the hot water is on here the base of the cold water faucet is still cold there so now you know that infrared can reveal things hidden in visible light. What do you think that's going to look like? I can tell you the hair dryer is on. I love this picture because you can not only see the heating elements in the hair dryer, you can also even see the turbulence in the air. So infrared can see through some things that are totally opaque in visible light. This is just a regular garden garbage bag where you might put yard waste in, but the infrared sees straight through it. It turns out that you personally are really, really glad about this property of infrared light because if you are unconscious in a burning building, this is how the firefighters will find you. Most firefighting stations, my, most firefighting companies have an infrared camera of some sort, often a handheld one because of this very property of infrared light. You can see on the left, once you know that the firefighter is there, you can see her through the smoke. But without knowing that the firefighter is there, it's really hard to see her through the smoke. So if you are unconscious in a burning building, this is how the firefighters will find you using a handheld infrared camera. You can see all sorts of details in this image too. You can see that the firefighter has a rebreather apparatus on her back helping to keep her cool because under all of that firefighting gear, it gets quite warm. So they need to have technology that helps keep them cool, cool when they're fighting the fires. Some things that are transparent in visible light are totally opaque in the infrared. This is a set of French doors in my living room. This door is closed, this door is open, and the infrared cannot see through the glass at all. This incidentally is why when you park your car in the sun in the summer, you have to drive using just two fingers touching the steering wheel because all of the sunlight gets through the windows of your car, heats up the inside of your car, but then the infrared can't get out. So the next time you can't touch your steering wheel, think about all the infrared that's stuck in your car. So now I've been showing you lots of pictures of optical and infrared things in everyday life. Now we're gonna to start to leave the everyday regime. Now what I have is um, something called a doer. It's really just a fancy thermos bottle. I've got liquid nitrogen in it. So on the top I have just the liquid nitrogen and this the liquid nitrogen is at 77 Kelvin and this is actually much colder than the infrared camera can see. So the infrared camera just gives up and colors it all black. Now on the bottom here I'm putting um, frozen peas and the liquid nitrogen. Now the frozen peas are cold to be sure but they're not 77 Kelvin. So they're warm compared to the background so the infrared camera can see them and they're glowing compared to the background. So that's exactly what's going on in space. The things that we're studying are cold, but they're warm compared to the background. And so that's why you can see them when we look with telescopes. So this is the familiar constellation Orion in optical light. This is what it looks like in infrared. There is so much going on here. How much you miss if you limit yourself to just the optical. Look here, I bet you knew that the Sword of Orion was a big star forming region, but did you know just how big of a cauldron of star formation it really is? It's an enormous cauldron of star formation. It's even related to the star formation that's going on in the belt of Orion. The, there's younger stars in the sword, there's older stars in the belt. Look at this big circle around the head of Orion. Big circles like that in, in astronomy usually means something's exploded. So almost certainly some star has gone kaboom near Orion's head some time ago. So there's all sorts of interesting things going on when you look in other wavelengths. So specifically within the infrared wavelengths, what kind of wavelengths are we talking about? So infrared is kind of roughly like a micron to a thousand microns roughly. So when astronomers say near infrared, they usually mean like a micron to about 10 microns. Mid infrared is like 10 to 100 microns ish. And far IR is maybe like 100 microns to 1000 microns ish. The, the boundaries between them are a little squishy. But roughly, like near IR is sort of wavelengths the size of smoke particles. Mid infrared is like the size of hair, the diameter of a human hair. And far IR, far IR wavelengths are like the diameter of a salt grain. So that's sort of the, the sizes of wavelengths that we're talking about. And just for context, optical light is about the size of um, bacteria, just for context. 
So we're going to slide over that infrared and we're going to add the 0.1 micron in for optical. So when we start talking about infrared missions, where do these wavelengths fall? So I use a lot of Spitzer data. So those are the wavelength ranges there. It goes from about three and a half microns to 160 microns. Wise goes from, again, about three and a half microns to about 22 microns. Herschel goes from about 70 microns to about 500 microns. So where do you think Hubble falls on this? Hubble's got instruments that, of course, are in the optical. The two instruments, optical instruments they have right now are ACS and WIPC3, but it also has an infrared instrument called NICMAS. Most of the really famous images that you see from Hubble are from ACS and WIPC3. C3, at least most recently. Where do you think JWST wavelengths fall? Think about that or even pause the video. That's where JWST wavelengths fall. But where do you think the most popular JWST images are? They're from near cam. So they are very, very near infrared not really into very far into the infrared at all. So a lot of the stuff that we do here at IPAC involves Spitzer, Wise, and Herschel data, which is much longer wavelength than a lot of the most popular images from JWST. So that's just for context. Now, one slide to wrap things up just in terms of units. Wavelengths, as I've already shown, are commonly expressed in microns which are also sometimes called micrometers, or um, you abbreviate it with a mu, or if you don't have a mu handy and you're going fast, you can also just write it with a um. So 5,000 angstroms is 500 nanometers, or half a micron, and that's visible light. Like one to five microns is near infrared, five to 30-ish microns is mid-infrared, 30-ish to 350 microns-ish is far infrared, but those boundaries are squishy. And it sometimes depends on exactly who you're talking to and what context they're talking and exactly how the light is detected, where those boundaries are. The brightnesses or fluxes for the, from these objects are most likely given in Janskys or Milijanskys or Microjanskys, depending on how bright the thing is. Um, in order to convert that to SI units, one Jansky is 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz. It um, sometimes, often, depending on the, the science, you can see magnitudes. It depends on exactly what you're doing and exactly the context in which you're, you're discussing it. But you can convert back and forth between Janskys and magnitudes. It used to be the case that magnitudes were relatively rarely used in infrared astronomy because a lot of the people that were working in the infrared were coming at it from the radio where Janskys are used all the time. But now that so many more people are working in the infrared, including people that are coming at it from the optical side, magnitudes are used a lot. You get more um, crossover and more fluency in units the longer wavelength you go. You, you get lots more people who are, will work interchangeably between Janskys and magnitudes the longer you go. You get much more prevalence of, of magnitudes for the shorter wavelengths and much more prevalence of Janskys in the longer wavelengths.